You are listening to Savage Bites Original Weird Fiction, Season 4, Episode 29. Written, illustrated, narrated, and produced by Christian Bravery. Could it be? Is it real? Is Savage Bites back? It is. Hello, Savage Bites enjoyers. Savage Bites is back. Back with a new story today. I must apologize to those of you who followed me for some time for the vast hiatus between uploads. Um, and if you're new to the channel, welcome. I really hope you enjoy yourself. Here at Savage Bites, we focus on original weird fiction in the vein of H.P. Lovecraft, but brought up to the modern day, shall we say. So welcome and welcome back if you've been here before. And my apologies for being away for so long. If you happen to have missed me, and if you have, I'm sorry, and I'm, I thank you. I was sidetracked by a huge art project that I'd had planned for many years. That took me quite a lot of time, two and a half years to execute, and I threw all my spare time into it. Now it, it is completed. Uh, I've yet to bring it to market, but that's going to happen soon. Now I have time and a strong inclination to get back into Savage Bites. Honestly... Of all my personal projects down the years, Savage Bites is the one that I've most enjoyed and found most satisfying. I've enjoyed writing, coming up with the stories. I've enjoyed creating the artwork. I've enjoyed the narration process and learning how to improve at that. And I've really, really enjoyed the engagement with uh, all you guys in the community. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting back and getting to talk to you guys again and um, working on a lot of new stories and yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting. And going into winter is the perfect time to pick up with horror and weird fiction. So, uh, yeah. So let's get set. Today, we will start with a story that I actually wrote a couple of years ago. And I've recently done a second draft on, created some artwork for. And, well, here it is today. It's called So Tasty, So Nice, a.k.a. The Ice Cream Van. Did you ever wonder about the ice cream van? About where it comes from? Did you ever wonder what made that soft serve ice cream taste so good? The ice cream van and its flavorful treats were a mystery and a delight to me as a child and a source of deep regret, as I shall tell of in its turn. Now I know the truth. I wish to God I didn't. The arrival of the ice cream van was a magical event back in those days, back in the 70s when I was a kid growing up. Its appearance late on a hazy afternoon, heralded distantly by that distinctive jingling motif, startled the slumbering neighbourhood into a gust of excited activity. Kids that had been loitering at a loose end in the heat were suddenly scattered, me and my little brother with all the rest, scurrying away to scrounge frantically for loose change emptying money boxes and piggy banks, begging parents for enough coppers for a 99 or an orange maid. I was mesmerized by the ice cream dispenser, the way you just pull that little handle and out it came, an endless foaming flow of creamy goodness. I was enthralled by the sight of it, eyes wide, already licking my lips in anticipation. We waited impatiently for our turn in the tight clutch of kids and parents gathered around the service hatch. Then later, depositing my precious coins carefully on the counter, eyes transfixed by the rippling cascade that would soon be mine, hands outstretched, clamouring for my prize. One drowsy Friday afternoon, late in August 1979, the last day of the holidays it was, before school resumed for the autumn term, that familiar sound was heard drifting across the estate, though on this occasion the tune was different. Looking back, I'm inclined to believe that there was something mournful about it, despite the bright jingle of the bells, but my memory may be tainted by what came later. None of us had seen this particular ice cream van before it hove into view in that balmy golden light. It must have been new to the area. It was a vintage model, but beautifully maintained, a gleaming creamy bubble of a thing, detailed in gleaming candy apple red, right down to the hubcaps its curving flank emblazoned with a slogan that read, So tasty, so nice, you'll be back for more. Hand-painted in a smooth flowing script, its narrow, low-set grille and bulbous headlights forming an impish little bright-eyed face at the front. 
Its chance of rival initiated the usual flurry of activity, kids fleeing to their respective houses in the desperate hunt for a few coins, only to return minutes later, clutching their hole. All of us tantalised, all drawn by an irresistible gravity to the curbside where the little van idled in the midst of a clutch of eager customers. Sammy, my kid brother, and I among them. I don't know if I noticed it at the time, caught up as I was in my craving for another sweet treat. But looking back, there was something different about this van. Some indefinable quirkiness in the behaviour of the man who served the ice cream. Something unsettling about his fixed smile. The van carried none of the usual branded lollies and ice creams that other vans had on offer. No display of bright advertising stickers garnished its gleaming exterior. Cornettos, fabs and funny faces, lemonade sparkles and zooms were all absent. All it had to offer was soft serve ice cream. There was a murmur of disappointment from some of the children, but I didn't care. I wanted a 99, a soft serve cone with a chocolate flake stuck in the top and strawberry sauce squirted all over. That was my favourite. But as fate would have it, I too was doomed to disappointment that day. When it came to our turn, Sam and I paid over what coins we had, watching avidly as two cones were primed in turn. It was the best ice cream I'd ever tasted, a rich, creamy vanilla unlike any other. Its flavour was deeper, fuller, and subtly nuanced with a bitter sweetness, a zest that I'd never tasted before or since. It was delicious, the archetype of what vanilla ice cream could be, what it should be. Crossing the road as we departed from the little van, lost in the hedonistic pleasure of the ice cream, I lost my footing at the curb. I tripped, fumbling my precious prize as I caught myself, only to watch in horror as it slipped from my grasp, landing upended on the hot pavement with a wet slap. Sammy stopped beside me, both of us transfixed by the forlorn sight of it lying there, the cone standing proud, ice cream already beginning to melt, a thin runnel of it trickling toward the gutter. From across the street, Tony Hodgkins laughed derisively as he lapped at a triple cone slathered in strawberry sauce. Some of the others joined in, in a short-lived gust of cackling laughter that sent me scurrying home with tears welling in my eyes and Sammy hot on my heels. That night, Sammy disappeared. He wasn't in his bed the next morning and nowhere to be found in the house when we searched. My dad went out into the street to look for him, but he came back alone. Later that day, the police came and talked to me and to my parents and to the kids on the estate. But no one knew anything. He was just gone. And he wasn't the only one. Tony and three of the other kids were missing too. And they didn't show up for school the following Monday morning. No one knew where they'd gone or what had happened to them. There was a big investigation and the school was suspended for a week while the police interviewed everyone. But nothing came of it. I never saw my little brother again. My mother never got over his disappearance. Dad turned to drink and got mean and angry. Things were never the same after Sammy went away. I still miss him all these years later. This afternoon, I heard it again. Heard it for the first time in 40 years, that old familiar melancholy tune drifting in through the open kitchen window from the street outside. That long forgotten melody subtly insinuating itself into my consciousness, stirring memories that had long lain dormant. My son and I had been playing Lego in the kitchen, pieces strewn scattered across the table as each of us dug through the pile to find the right piece for our creations. What's that music, Dad? said Sam without looking up. An ice cream van, I replied half distracted by a sudden chilling touch of regret. What's an ice cream van, Dad? He paused, looking at me, a partially completed Lego robot clutched in one tiny hand. It's a van that sells ice cream, I smiled weakly. You hardly ever saw them nowadays, only at events and festivals, really. So the appearance of one in our leafy neighbourhood was genuinely surprising, not to say disconcerting given the eerie similarity to that tune that rose up out of a decades-old memory and brought with it the bitter tang of grief. Sam scooted off his chair to the floor. I want ice cream, 
He grinned, hopping up and down excitedly on the spot. Waving the robot in my face, he repeated the phrase, this time in imitation of a robot voice. I want ice cream, Dad. A smile cracked my lips, quelling the updraft of remorse that had caught me all unawares out of the blue, replacing it with the simple joy of a father at his son's exuberance. In a sudden surge of nostalgia for my childhood days, I snatched my wallet from the kitchen table and, with Sam in tow, we headed out to see if we might catch the ice cream van. There was something familiar about the quaint little cream and cherry van idling at the corner of our street. A fresh flood of deja vu washed over me at the sight of it. Involuntarily, I drew to a halt, frozen there on the pavement, my head swimming against the tide of memory, my eyes fixated on the van. Dad, come on, I want ice cream. Sam tugged at my limp hand insistently, and his efforts brought me back to myself. Self-consciously, I scrubbed a single tear from my eye with the heel of my hand. Thankfully, the boy hadn't noticed. I was being foolish, illogical. The mainline injection of the music, and now the sight of that strangely familiar van, had jolted me momentarily out of myself. And for a space, I was that frightened and confused little boy, grieving for his lost little brother. I hadn't known that I still carried such an emotional burden after all these long years, yet here it was. Sam tugged insistently at my hand again, dragging me back to the present. He was so like his namesake, Sammy, my lost little brother. I smiled weakly. Come on then, I said affectionately. Let's get some ice cream. At the serving hatch, all my vague suspicions were confirmed. It was the same van. On its flank, the inscription read, So tasty, so nice. You'll be back for more, in glittering candy apple red on cream. And I could swear it was the same man, the silent man with the eerily fixed smile, the one that had served me and my little brother on that summer's day so long ago. It was impossible. He hadn't aged a day. I thought I must be mistaken, but deep down, I knew I wasn't. I was flustered and confused, while he waited within the hatch, swaying gently, half hidden in the shadow against the glare of the late afternoon sun. In the gloom I could see his eyes fixed on us, and blinking. But how could it be him? After all these years, it seemed a ridiculous notion. But how could I doubt my own eyes? He looked precisely as he had back in 1979, so far as I could recall. How could it be? Looking closer, with adult eyes, I noticed that there was something more than strange about him. Something a little too perfect about his shiny, slick back hair. Something unsettling about those beady and blinking eyes. Something discomforting about the glossy smoothness of his face and that crisp white unblemished uniform. He was disconcertingly silent and never spoke throughout our brief interaction. Instead, communicating in a series of nods and gestures that, though unconventional, served well enough to accomplish the sale of two 99 ice cream cones. Numb and grimly fascinated by this strange apparition from my past, I found myself fiercely reticent to linger a moment longer and deposited a £10 note on the countertop as payment. Keep the change, I mumbled as I hastily retreated, my son's hand gripped so firmly in mine that he scolded me for it as I dragged him away. With that, we made our departure. My son delighted and consumed in the enjoyment of this unexpected treat, while I moved like a man half lost in a dream, unable to shake from my mind the uncanny visage of the ice cream van's mute proprietor, and the startling incongruity of his appearance here and now after so many years. And with it, rising from the darkest depths of my subconscious, resurfaced the haunting grief that I had harboured for my lost little brother. A grief I had never quite lain to rest. The ice cream itself was without doubt the same one I had tasted and subsequently dropped on that summer's day so long ago. It was exactly as I had remembered it, wonderfully rich and creamy with that unique edge of the bittersweet that set it apart from any other. It really was the best ice cream I'd ever tasted, and though my experience at the van had been unsettling, I was nevertheless deeply satisfied that I'd been able to enjoy it this time around. It was all a conundrum to me. But as so often happens with unusual experiences, its piquant strangeness was diluted with the passage of time and the return of normalcy, so that within an hour my equilibrium 
was more or less completely restored. That night I was awoken out of a fitful sleep. Had I heard the sharp click of the front door being gently closed? Who could that have been? My wife was beside me, breathing low and even. Nonplussed and queerly alert, I started from the bed to investigate. Hauling a dressing gown across my shoulders, I crept down the stairs. Nothing seemed amiss in the house, and outside the broad street was empty and silent. The pavement gleaming orange under the streetlight, its surface slick after the rain. Bemused, I closed the door and headed back upstairs, pausing to look in on Sam on my way back to bed. His bed was empty. The covers tossed aside, the sheets wrinkled and still warm to the touch. Where could he be? Then, in the midst of my conjecture, I heard it. It was ever so faint, and ever so familiar, the familiar mournful lament of the ice cream van. The one we had seen that day, the one I'd seen all those years ago, the day before my little brother had disappeared. And, in a flash of appalling realisation, it made sense. I fled downstairs, not pausing to wake my sleeping wife, and burst out of the front door, jogging a few paces, head on a swivel, scanning the benighted street in anxious dismay, before pausing briefly to listen, divining the direction of that distant, dismal melody. It wavered on the night air, teasing, tantalising me, luring me in. I knew it for certain now, knew that wherever that van was to be found, there I would find Sam. And I knew the time was already running out. I ran along the street, following that distant, mournful Pied Piper theme, bare feet measuring time on the cold, rain-slick asphalt, oblivious to the chill night air, my breath visible against the night. At the end of Maysfield Road, I turned onto the broad expanse of Shakespeare Avenue, the darkness punctuated at intervals by a lurid smear of acid orange oozing from the streetlight above, the occasional parked car static in the glow, like a specimen locked in amber. All the houses were set back from the road, and dark under a waning moon, their occupants sleeping peacefully, oblivious to my plight. I ran on, desperately, under the frail moonlight, through street after winding street, whose names escaped me, drawn on inexorably by the haunting, sombre melody of the ice cream van. A desperate, haunted, hunting creature, driven on by that preternatural parental urge to defend his young. My only thoughts were of Sam, of finding him safe and sound before he too was taken from me in the night. The broad tract of the deserted car park gleamed into the vast black star-speckled firmament. At its centre squatted the ice cream van, theatrically spotlit, candy apple red and cream under a single illuminating lamppost whose ghostly light flickered fretfully, sporadically blotting out the scene in stark blackness. Ahead of me, at some distance, I saw the silhouette of my son, traipsing listlessly towards the van, drawn on by the hypnotic allure of its lilting melody, his long shadow reaching back to touch me across the bare concrete. More figures emerged out of the darkness as I advanced, listless children moving in a trance, attracted by the irresistible magnetism of that sombre motif. I slowed my pace as the first of them neared the van, a diminutive form proceeding into the bright circle of light. I watched in stunned fascination as they approached the service hatch, the small bright face upturned in rapt anticipation. I was too far away to hear what was said, but it looked as though they were engaged in conversation with the van's unsettling occupant, with whom I had interacted that previous afternoon, the one whose strange countenance had, though I loathed to admit it, sent me scurrying away in confused apprehension. The child glided closer and seemed to speak again. Overhead, the streetlight flickered and went out, leaving all in absolute blackness. When, but a moment later, it flickered on again, the child that had been stood by the van was gone. I gasped involuntarily, rooted to the spot in horrified fascination as a second child entered the circle of light and approached the van. I can't attest to exactly what happened next, but after a brief exchange I saw a silhouetted figure emerge from the hatch, looming ominously over the child who waited passively below. 
An instant later, the child was snatched up out of view and dragged bodily into the yawning moor of the service hatch. I may have shouted then. I'm not sure. I broke into a dismal, trance-like trot, desperate to reach my boy before he too succumbed to the same fate as those others. But it was like running in a dream, legs cycling, sluggish and unresponsive, feet shuffling, hands clutching at thin air. Whether this was merely a perceptual side effect or a genuine corporeal result of my fear and desperation. I'll never know, but as I ran on, that haunting melody grew to encompass me, swelling into a haunting symphony that filled the air about me, sweeping me up, its mournful kinesthesia taking hold of me like a rising gale. I arrived at the service hatch just behind my son. I wanted to reach out to grab him and pull him away, to lift him up and hug him close to me and run to carry him to safety. But I just stood there behind him, unable to move or even lift a hand to prevent what was coming. Before us, the interior of the van was veiled in darkness, the brightness of the overhead light casting it in deep shadow, rendering the hatchway a gaping black moor. I heard Sam speak, but I'm not certain what he said. He emerged then, slowly leaning out of the hatchway, thick hands gripping the sill. First, the glossy hair moved out into the light, his head bowed. Then came the shoulders, protruding further and impossibly further than a man could ever do. He slowly arched his back, finally revealing that ageless face, those blank and gleaming eyes that weren't eyes at all, just markings. I became aware of it gradually, my rational mind fighting to refuse the evidence before me. But the truth could not be resisted. This was not a man. It was the facsimile of a man. It was a thing. The details of that human face, the neat arrangement of the uniform, that too glossy black hair, all merely an elaborate camouflage, a subterfuge concealing the truth. A mask hiding a monster. The great thickening trunk loomed out of the hatch, undulating toward me. Abruptly it split at the throat, a long vertical slit that ran down to the middle of the torso. As its quivering lips parted, they dripped gelatinous strings of gleaming saliva. A multitude of stubby black grasping feelers emerged from the opening slit, like so many monstrous earthworms, hunting and clutching in the air, tasting it. I watched in paralysed horror as the thing descended toward my son, those questing claws reaching out to probe him touching his face, his neck, grasping him, lifting him bodily, consuming him whole, ingesting his listless and struggling little body. In a moment, Sam was gone. And all that remained of him was a Lego robot lying broken and discarded on the ground beneath the hatch. I gazed at it, frozen in impotent horror, my mind blank, a mirror-like pool and rippled by thought or concern. Only one thing penetrated my silent prison of denial and despair, and that was the music, that gorgeous, heart-rending melody, poignant with the untold pathos of a thousand stolen souls. It's warm and safe in here, in here with Sam and the others. Nothing can harm us now. We huddle within, close together, like unborn siblings in the womb listening to the endless swell and fall of that wonderfully soothing music, as gradually, oh so gradually, we are digested, dissolved and ingested by the thing that lives in the ice cream van. Now I know the secret. Now I know the unique ingredient that makes the ice cream from this particular van so special. What gives it that piquant, bittersweet tang what makes it so tasty? What makes it so nice? Why you come back for more? Those of you familiar with uh, Golden Age Weird Fiction will no doubt have uh, noticed the uh, distinct homage to uh, Donald A. Wolheim's Mimic, uh, a story that I covered a couple of years, three, maybe three years ago now, three, four years ago, um, 
back in episode one of Masters of Weird. Uh, I love that story. And that, that story has uh, a protagonist, kind of. Or the, the protagonist in that story is also the monster, um, who the the proprietor of the ice cream van is heavily modelled upon. Although, in my story, he's quite a mean, child-eating son of a bitch. Whereas, uh, the, uh, the character in Mimic is something of a pathetic character, really. He's, um, he's, he's in no, no way, um, a danger to humanity in, in the, in the direct sense, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I just really love that story, and um, I guess it, in some way, inspired this one. But uh, but yeah, also this was like kind of inspired by you know my childhood, you know, growing up and uh, and memories of you know the just the typical summer holidays, you know, the balmy, long, sunny days, and lots of free time, and you know that was those long days were punctuated by the exciting appearance of the ice cream van and I kind of thought, you know, it's the, it's the summer not necessarily an obvious time for horror motifs but I thought, how can we take like a really typical summer trope and turn it into something sinister so uh, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of the um, inspiration for this tale I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it um, it's good to be back, I'm really excited to be back and um and to get working on some more stories and some more uploads for you guys. And, um, you know, if you enjoyed the story, please, uh, you know, drop a like. Um, if you're new to the channel, please uh, subscribe. There's going to be more coming. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of old stuff on the site that you might enjoy. On the, on the channel, rather. Um, and, yeah, um, if you've got any pals who are into this sort of weird fiction, horror tales and stuff, you know, spin them a link over and, you know, see if they enjoy it. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'll leave it there and I'll see you in the next one.